Thank you so much, Victoria, and distinguished guests. It's a great honor to be here in Kiev to talk about Avignon. I've given this presentation quite a few times over the last few weeks, and, and some of you have been in the audience. I'll keep it brief. I'll try to look at some of the aspects of Babignard which we're still not so sure about and to ask some questions how it compares with, with other mass shootings. Um, you may be familiar with the, the story of the lone tree, how I managed to find where Haley was standing when he took uh, some of his photographs and now it's, it's a great honor that those positions are marked by these uh, stones where you can actually see where he was standing and we have that engraved in the landscape of Babignard today. So I'm going to ask the question, to what extent was the Babiyar massacre on September 29th to 30th representative for the Holocaust by bullets? And I don't mean by any chance to, to question that it, it's the most important and significant mass shooting, but to me it was in some respects different, in some respects more complicated, some, re some respects simply much quicker than, than what happened in, in many other places. We heard, for example, today about Kherson, where there was a ghetto there was never really a plan to, to create a ghetto in Kiev. It may be because it was a capital city. Other capitals like Krakow was very reluctant to have a ghetto. Also, it caused a lot of problems to have a ghetto. In Minsk, they had a ghetto, but they had to keep working on it many times. And um, in Rivne, also, they, they, they didn't really want a ghetto in that, that brief capital. So capitals have a, a different attitude towards, towards ghettos. Um, I, I won't talk so much about the Einsatzgruppen, I think we, we've heard enough about that yesterday. Um, just important to, to recognize that it was a, a very mixed force. People, um, some were senior SS officers, but many were just drivers. There were lots of guards who also were, were low-ranking police officers who were assigned to the Einsatzgruppen. There were translators, some of whom were ethnic German Ukrainians. So it, it's a heterogeneous force, and, and you can discuss that for a long time. Obviously, the, the big difference uh, at Babiya was the killing of women and children and the, the attempt to, to eliminate uh, almost the entire Jewish population of a city. Actually, not all the Jews of, of, of Kiev were shot. There were some kept alive in work camps. Some of those were the people who managed to, to escape from the exhumation commando. I think the, the explosions on Kreshatik are significant. Um, it had a number of different consequences. It gave the Wehrmacht a, a, a pretext um, to, to accelerate the, the extermination of the Jews as a reprisal. And I think we have to think about what happened just before this in, in places like Bialetsirkov, um, where they had problems with the women and children left over. Um, Fastov is not very well researched, but that was another place where almost all the Jews were killed just a few days before they got to Kiev. And these, these um, the Sonder Command of 4A and the other um, special units, they were concentrated in Kiev uh, literally very, very quickly after the city was taken. This, this was, to some extent, very closely coordinated between the SS and the Wehrmacht. And the, the reason uh, also for killing the Jews was the lack of, of housing in Kiev, because these explosions and the resulting fires, which the, the Wehrmacht um, had problems putting out, and they even destroyed some houses themselves to cause a fire break to stop the fire from spreading, meant that there were a lot of people homeless in Kiev in these days in September. So here's just a quick look at Hilberg's um, process of the Holocaust. In Babinyar, these, these four stages, definition, concentration, confiscation, destruction, are literally compressed into just two or three days. It's, it's a very rapid, and, and, and that is almost unprecedented. Nowhere else did it happen quite so quickly, not even in places um, close to, to Moscow that were captured. They didn't do it that quickly. They often set up a ghetto even there. So we have a lot of stages here. Um, we'll go through them briefly in a moment, but the ones that are a little bit unusual, the posters, we saw posters used in Kherson. There was another place, Lubny, where they have an almost identical poster for the people to, to, to appear um, as if for an evacuation. But in some ways, the evacuation from, from Kiev is more like what was just starting in Germany at that time. The people took some luggage with them. They were, thought they were going somewhere else. They imagined they were going to the railway station. Um, the registration documents, um, it seems a little strange. This seems to have been done a bit further down the, the process uh, than, than just where they go into the, um, the first checkpoint. Um, but it does seem that passports with the, the Jewish nationality in them were important to distinguish who was Jewish. 
And then the, the use of explosions to, to cover over the bodies in the ravine is fairly unique to Kiev. Explosions were used at other places to create mass graves, but particularly here, it seemed the uh, only way the Germans could cover over the bodies rapidly. And that, uh, I'll talk about that a little bit. So here's the placard calling people to appear. This is how Jews received the news. They, they were uncertain, but they thought they would be sent away to work. This is a, a rare photograph from Stefan Maschkevich, um, taken by a, a German soldier. He says, he wrote on the back, Jews taking their last journey on earth. And here you can see some people literally went by horse and cart down Melnikov Street. This is Max's reconstruction. We, we don't have an actual photograph of, of the checkpoint, but we have a lot of descriptions. And it was quite chaotic. People couldn't take their possessions further on their horses and carts. They could only carry things from this point onwards. Um, one or two Jews managed to escape at this point in, in the confusion. Um, and also non-Jews were at least, I think, generally instructed to go back, maybe by even Ukrainian policemen who were there. But, um, Mainly only Jews went through here, but one or two non-Jews did, did get through the checkpoint. But this is also unusual. Most other places, when people were going to be shot, there was not a checkpoint to sort out Jews from non-Jews. and There weren't any non-Jews really accompanying them. You can think of somewhere like Korolici, where when the Jews were deported out of the town, um, they were kind of jeered, and, and, and uh, uh, the, the local inhabitants went to see them off to make sure they were gone. In Kiev, I think it's, it's more mixed. There are a number of mixed marriages we get those stories particularly because some of those people survive, um, but uh, quite common for, for one Ukrainian spouse to stay at home and the Jewish spouse to go with the children to the checkpoint. So this is the, the famous photograph of the Allais. I, I'm grateful to Alexander Kulov, Kulov for making this available to us. And we were able to locate where this is. This is Dorojitska Street. You can still see a similar alley of trees there today. And this is the, the possessions, also Father Dubois mentioned. There, there were massive amounts of possessions piled up here. The Germans who went past, they, they described this as they go along. This is probably the place where the, the registration took place. Certainly there were documents piled up here on, on the ground. This is just near the end of the Alley of Trees. And um, we have a description from the, the following spring when the snow melted. There were still things like baby carriages and, and documents, passports, visible on this, this piece of ground close to the cemeteries. This is an aerial view, so you can see the, the, the route down the, the alley of trees. It's a little hard to use the pointer here. This just gives you an overview, and, and I think many of you may be familiar with this now, that they went down Melnikov Street, then left down Kahatna, right on Dora Ryszczka. And there, we kind of lose track of exactly where they went. I just found one testimony from a, a, a Jewish boy who managed to escape who talks about going down a side ravine, which seems to indicate that they went down the main ravine to, to the sand quarry where you see between four and five, that's the sand quarry. And that's, that's where they were forced to undress. This is the Yekel testimony. He talks about um, going into a, 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 an area, but one point we were driven around, there were many small ravines. And I think this is the part that's described by some witnesses as like a corridor. It's between, obviously, between Dorogozhitska Street and, and the sand quarry. And again, we don't have really good descriptions because the German descriptions and the witness descriptions, they, they contradict each other almost completely. The Germans say there was no brutality. Um, it was peaceful. They, they just went from one place to another. Um, there was some described being halfway along that they couldn't really see where they were disappearing to. So we know they, they probably went down into the ground and came up again. But the exact route is not clear. Um, the, the few description of survivors talk of a really brutal corridor being beaten uh, with sticks, the dogs hounding them. And this is one of the, the most harrowing parts, together with, with the forced undressing and the whole process. And uh, I won't go into details today, but. We don't have many descriptions, but they're, they're very, very harrowing. These are the piles of clothes. So from, the, from one of the German testimonies, it seems that initially they were collecting valuables on the way, but this was slowing things down, that there was becoming a blockage. It took them too long to get the possessions off people, particularly valuables. So they decided to order them all to undress here in the sand quarry, and, and this is the result. And you can even see roughly the route they took, which is 
probably around to the left to, to go up this, this steep hill to get into to the Western Spur where the shooting took place. This is the, the, one of the famous Halo photographs. And it seems that, that Halo was just, just going for a walk that day. I think he, he knew that it was significant what he did, but this, these are not German propaganda photographs. They're, they're taken for his personal use. This again is Max's wonderful work from, from an overhead view, and you can see the, the pile of clothing going around to the left, and you might just see roughly where the, the so-called notch is, where um, possibly Pranichiva was, was, was shot, um, but definitely where most of the Jews went into this western spur at the top where the shooting took place. Again, a reconstruction of the sand quarry. Of course, we don't know exactly what happened here. There are, there are only a few descriptions. It, it may have been even more chaotic than this, but this gives you some idea how the, the Jews were um, forced to undress and then, then move on to the, the slope further on. And again, we don't know the exact route up the slope, um, but it is described both by Germans and, and uh, survivors that they went up to a slope before they're going down into the ravine where the shooting took place. And it seems that most, if not all, the shooting took place in this western spur on those two days. Of course, there were many other shooting sites uh, in the rest of the occupation. So this is the famous Haler photograph. And we're pretty sure this was taken. So after the, the sides of the ravine have been blown up and then the Soviet POWs are being used to cover over the mass grave, um, it certainly looks like something has happened to the sides of the ravine shortly before this. And they're definitely steeper than most other ravines, even the ones we, you can see today. So Victor Trill as a driver who gave us a very detailed description and actually a sketch map which helped me to find um, the location in the Western Spur. And there were several other corroborating testimonies. And this is really how we did the work. We, we got together as, as many different sources, aerial photographs, witness testimonies, and the ground photographs. And on their own, they don't make much sense, but together it all, it all kinds of creates a, a, a very strong and clear narrative that I've been trying to tell. Again, this shows where most of the Jews were probably shot. We don't know this for sure, but it seems that this Western Spur was the main location of the shootings. This is a description of how the actual shooting took place. Uh, I won't read it out, I'll let you read it yourself, but there were probably in groups of around 12 people, although maybe only as few as four were shooting at one time in each group. We think there were three, four groups, maybe as many as eight groups, but it seems unlikely that you could get that many different groups of Jews into the ravine at one time. So I think perhaps four groups is more likely. Perhaps as many as 120 shooters altogether. Most of them were shot with machine pistols, short distance, either to the neck or when they're kneeling down or lying face down on top of others who'd been shot. One of the problems is the ravine itself becomes full with bodies after a while. This may be the reason why in the evening they started shooting people from the edge of the ravine, either from behind or as Pranicheva describes from the opposite side, which seems like a crazy way to do it for a long time. I was skeptical of that testimony, but it does match up with the sort of use of the notch as a place from which people might have been shot. And those Jews who survived were mostly those who came to the ravine in the evening of the first day when the shooting was fairly chaotic and they just jumped into the pit before they were shot. Several such people managed to escape, and uh, it shows that it, it wasn't always done the same way. It may have been slightly different on the second day as well. Again, this is two possible routes into the Western Spur. It may be as many as uh, two different ones coming through the notch. We don't know exactly how they got up to the notch, but um, I think Max's research is still um, producing clearer or, or more um, detailed views of, of what the notch looked like so we can perhaps work out what the best path was. And, and even the, the halo photograph shows probably where they went up a little bit further um, to the right of where that blue arrow is. It might have been easier to climb up. Um, Ilya mentioned dogs yesterday. We do have testimonies both from the Jewish witnesses and the, um, the police that there were dogs present, although probably not very many. Initially, some of the police battalions were on bicycles, so it was unlikely they had dogs at that stage. Um, but certainly the officers had some dogs and uh, we even have the name of one dog. This is Pranicheva giving her testimony. Again, I, I won't dwell on that. Uh, it is very complicated, and, and it changes a little bit over time, but it's still one of the most important testimonies we have. And she describes especially the undressing in the sand quarry, the chaotic situation there, and, and what happened even to some non-Jews who were with her 
who were then dis decided to be shot by the officer just before. I'll just go through that testimony. Here's the halo image again further down with the, the POWs covering over once the explosions have taken place. You can see quite a lot of POWs. Again, we don't have uh, many testimonies from, from any of these POWs, of course, because most of them died during the war. But several Germans mention POWs being brought to deliver it over. Um, and the, the role of Ukrainians is also important. It seems that they almost certainly were not in the shooting squads, but, but definitely also among the cordon guards and, and those at the undressing place, maybe just clearing up the clothes, but probably also forcing people to undress. This is about the explosives. So there's only one testimony, but it's very clear. And it is corroborated by many ear hearsay testimonies that say the same thing. This is slightly unusual, but as I say, they, they did use explosions during the winter when they couldn't um, create mass graves very easily. And um, there, there is another description by Janssen who went with some Wehrmacht officers to, to plan the explosions the day before. So it does seem to be very likely this was how it was done. Just on the property, this is a, a report from one of, from Sonder Commander 4A in Kiev, 10th of October. We assume this is about Dabiyar. The numbers are not massive, but certainly quite large. And uh, I think the reason they probably don't have all the property here is that other units may have collected some themselves. Quite a lot may have gone missing, uh, but it is quite a lot of, of property. Here you see what I was mentioning before, that they, they then searched the clothing for the valuables because they didn't have time to, to search for valuables on the way because so many people were coming. Uh, just a couple of other things to mention. Obviously, the, the Syrits camp plays an important role as this is uh, where the exhumation group was chosen for. And, and the, the prisoners of the Syrits camp were witnesses to, to many shootings in the, in the, the months after Babi Yar, right up to the end of the occupation. Um, a couple of other things I wanted to mention uh, well, also, um, obviously, the sand quarry is um, still plays a very important role in 1943. So it's not very clear on this, but there are two bunkers half sunken into the ground. This is one of the first aerial photographs that really got me uh, interested in the sand quarry. It's an important thing. And you even see a guard tower there, a shadow of it opposite to the bunkers. And this is exactly what's described by the witnesses. So again, we have the the aerial photography and the witness testimony corroborate each other. So on the 29th to 30th of September 1943, you get a, a mass escape by prisoners from these bunkers who've been working in the exhumations. They've been burning bodies, having had them ex exhumed from the Western Spur and from as many as nine other sites around Babiar. Um, the funeral pyres are built on Matseva, so gravestones taken from the Jewish cemetery, which are broken up and probably buried even now today somewhere on the grounds of Babi Yar. So it, it's a desecration in, in many, many ways. Uh, but fortunately, from the escape of 15 prisoners, we, we do know the details, of, or some details about the exhumations, and also they, they corroborate the, the location of the Western Spur as the main place where things took place. So I, I was going to compare it with some other um, sites that we looked at, but I'll just check the time. Two minutes, okay, so I'll just let you see the photographs. Obviously, it's not the same everywhere. To mention a few other major ones, Ponari is, an, is a site where very many Jews, probably 90,000 or more people altogether were, were shot over a much longer period. Ronaya Gora is an important site that needs much more work. Um, Sani, they collect Jews from a number of different towns to, to one camp, and then again, a, a large number of people are shot. So, there are many large mass shootings, but the methods are different in each case. And then, of course, the mass, mass majority take place in the summer of 42 as ghetto um, destruction operations where the, the last remaining Jews are, are shot. And there, they, they all know what's coming. People hide in bunkers. Um, so Kiev is unusual in the sense that there, there isn't active resistance, but there's, there's a lot of, of reason for that, that um, it's almost only elderly women, children, uh, and you can see this even from this photo from Lubny. The, these are not the, um, the people who are fighting in the Red Army. It's those who are left behind. So I'll just flick through. This is the Zolotonosha shooting, which is by the same units as at, Sun, uh, as at Babinyar a few days later. And it's also off the edge of a cliff. Um, so there are quite a few comparisons there. And I think the, this, these kind of detailed um, research projects still have to be carried out. 
So here you see the Ukrainian police participated and they shot them at the top of a steep cliff. This is Kharkiv, which is sometimes mistaken for Babinyo because there are some similarities here. Again, a ghetto was set up in Kharkov. This is another operation in, in Ustanivka district, south um, in, of um, Kirovograd. And um, here, Jews from as many as six or seven different locations were brought mainly by truck, some on foot, in one day. And again, they used a ravine. And there they went to get the half-Jewish children at the very end of the um, shooting process. And, and when it was exhumed in the 1990s by the Australians, uh, they found the, the, the bodies of the children on the top of the grave. This is finally Lutsk, where you saw how carefully prepared the grave was. So some things are similar, but quite a few things are different at, at Babinya. And I think we, we do have to um, research and, and be, be careful not to, to generalize from one mass shooting to say that they're all the same, because there were many big differences. Okay, thank you.